As we move into chapter three, the principles of pharmacology, it is extremely important. I know there are probably 30 of them, the key terms in the beginning of this chapter. It is imperative that you know them and you understand them. Um, if I just gave you first pass effect, I need you to understand what that means. So by knowing what those terms are, then you'll better be able to understand all of this information going forward because this is truly the meat and potatoes um, for a good foundation in pharmacology okay you need to know about absorption the adverse reactions be able to differentiate the two um, adverse and expected <clears throat> you need to know about generic versus trade names you need to know about uh, pharmacodynamics and um, the pharmacotherapeutics and we're going to talk about all of those um, but I, I'm going to stress to you, um, I, I don't know how else to say it other than you truly need to take the time to know and understand the definitions or the key terms in the beginning of chapter three. Um, if you can master those, then you are going to breeze through chapter three um, without any problems. So familiarize yourself with those. If you quiz yourself, whatever you need to do to understand those, um, please make sure that you're putting forth every effort to know and understand them. If you have a question about them, feel free to email me. Okay, so we'll dive into chapter three. Drug names. So when we start talking about drug names, there's several different types. You have a chemical name, you have a generic, and then of course the trade name. Okay, so the chemical name is exactly what it sounds like. It is just the chemical structures within that medication. They're extremely hard to pronounce or even spell. So that's why we have generic and trade names, okay? So be mindful as we go through here that you know what each of these names are and in what form you're going to see them in, okay? So generic names, they're non-proprietary. <clears throat> this is the most common drug name used, okay? Proprietary is just another name for generic, okay? Now, with generic, they're the same. It does not matter where you go in the U.S. or any other place. For example, I have here ibuprofen and acetaminophen. They're the same generic name no matter where you go. Um, you will know that you're getting ibuprofen or acetaminophen. There's no registered trademark. They're not abbreviated. And remember, generic is the most common, okay? This is how you're going to be tested on your boards and ATI, okay? It's typically by the, gener the generic name, not trade names, okay? So remember that. Now, trade names um, are assigned by pharmacy companies that manufacture the drug, okay? That's known as your brand name, like Tylenol, Benadryl or Advil. Okay, you may have four manufacturers with four different names for the same exact drug. Okay, so that's going to be your trade name. That's kind of like wearing trade name clothing. Okay, just because you pay more for it doesn't mean it works better or differently. Okay, they're all um, manufactured the same way. They all have the same chemical makeup. It's just a matter of who is selling that drug, okay? So that's their trade name or their brand, okay? So I've given you an example, <clears throat> Narcan. The generic name you can see is naloxone hydrochloride injection. Chemical name, I'm not even going to attempt to say that um, or spell it. That's why we don't use chemical names, but you still need to know what a chemical name is. And the brand name, of course, was Narcan. So that's why we typically go with brand names is because they're more familiar. That's what we hear on TV um, because they want to sell it to you. They want you to buy their product. OK, so that's where we see those trade names or those brand names. Um, so you can see why we don't use chemical names. And um, trade names are, again, just assigned by the company that manufactures that drug. So you guys will need to know the difference in all three of those because you will see different scenarios on your testing in which you will need to know if it's a generic trade name or if it's just their chemical name and what makes them different okay generic it's the same no matter where you go it's less expensive okay generics a huge um 
plus for those who have limited income. Okay, I can't afford a trade name. Okay, so I buy generics. I'm on a fixed income. It works perfect. Okay, so know the perks about the different um, names. Okay. Okay, so pharmacokinetics. Kinetic, if you look back, just simply means relating to or resulting from motion. So pharmacokinetics is just simply describing how that drug moves in the body. You know, what does the body do to the drug, okay? From the stomach to the circulatory system, from muscle to circulatory, okay? So we're gonna talk about how it moves from um, the side of ingestion or injection, through the body to get where it needs to be. And then we're gonna talk about how age and disease processes impact that movement, okay? So we're gonna talk about absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion when we're talking about pharmacokinetics, okay? And we'll move a little bit more in depth. I just kinda of wanna get you familiar with what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so pharmacodynamics, of course, dynamics is just a force that stimulates a change, okay? So what does the drug do to the body once it reaches that um, intended site or that receptor site? And so we're gonna talk about a lock and key receptor system. Um, there's a little video that I've attached also. Um, it's a little bit long if I remember correctly, but it's well worth um, watching because you it helps you understand that lock and key receptor site or, um, what the body does and how it reaches that intended site, okay, and how it differentiates the different receptor sites. Okay, so again, dynamics is just simply a force that stimulates a change, okay? Now, with that, we're not creating a, a new um, body process or anything of that nature. We're just maybe changing something in the body with that dynamic, okay? So pharmacotherapeutics is simply just that, therapeutics. It's relating to healing. Um, is what we're giving this patient, are we seeing uh, a change in the treatment of the disease or the process of the disease or progression of the disease, okay? Why are we using it? What, what response do we see? And are we seeing that? Okay, so those are just the determining factors of, is it working, okay? Is it therapeutic? We talked about labs previously and pulling those therapeutic levels. It's the same thing here. We're just not necessarily pulling drug uh, lab values, okay? We just wanna know if it's therapeutic, meaning are we seeing a change or response in the progression of the um, disease in using this particular drug regimen? So drug receptor sites. So receptor sites are where the drug performs its action. Okay, that remember is our pharmacodynamics um, located either in or on a cell. And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a little example in the next um, slide. So the receptors just know that that performs two functions. It either activates or inhibits. And if you look on page 24 in your book, you can, um, you can follow along with that. We're gonna talk about agonists, partial agonists, and then the antagonist. Okay, so if you watch the video, then you'll know already that an agonist is an activator, okay? It's um, perpetuating something that the body already does, okay? So I'm already producing, let's say, some type of hormone, but I'm not really producing enough, okay? So it increases that activity. So that's what an agonist does, okay? Um, a partial agonist is, um, it does the same thing as an agonist, just on a smaller scale, okay? So it doesn't maybe make you produce as much of that hormone, but it kind of performs the same activity. So an antagonist, if you've ever really been into literature and reading, you know what an antagonist is. It kind of, a, it's a blocker. It a block, it blocks the effects of that cell activity. So when we go back to talking about hormones, I may have too, producing too much hormone, okay? so what I wanna do is turn that down a little bit. So it's gonna inhibit that activity at a certain receptor site in order to turn down the production, okay? So just remember that antagonists are going to block the action or inhibit, okay? 
And there are certain receptor sites, and we're going to talk about that, that it's going to attach to to um, prevent that activity. So remember, your agonists are the ones that are going to um, perpetuate or increase an activity, okay? A partial is the same thing. It's just gonna do on a smaller scale. And an antagonist at those receptor sites, again, are gonna be your inhibitors and your blockers, okay? So we'll move forward and look at an example. So you'll, hopefully if you watch the video, that's why I put those in here, is because sometimes being able to watch a little video <clears throat> outside of listening to me lecture is more of, uh, or is helpful in relating this information because they're not in the classroom. I can't really, I guess, explain it to you any better. So please be mindful of watching those videos. So um, be sure to know what those three do. Of course, on the test, you're gonna see all three of them. Um, you're not gonna see agonist, antagonist, or partial agonist. You're gonna have a scenario in which um, you're gonna have to decide is it an agonist or an antagonist? So you need to know what each of them do, okay? So let's look, look at the example I have next. So I use this picture to kind of help you understand what we're talking about with the agonist and the antagonist, okay? So they're both drugs to either create um, something to mimic what we are already producing or turn off what we're already producing too much of, okay? So um, just know that a ligand, when you see that on the left, is just a protein that binds to the receptor sites, okay? So um, it doesn't matter whether it's an agonist or an antagonist, we refer to those as ligands, okay? So those ligands or ligands, however you wanna say that, is what fits into that receptor site. So your receptor sites and your ligands, um, in your medications, whether agonist or antagonist, are kind of like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. I think that's how your book refers to it also. So in order to get the appropriate effect, we have to get the correct ligand into that receptor site. Okay, so I always use the example of um, testosterone. Okay, so our body produces testosterone. It binds to the receptor for a normal uh, physiological process. Okay, so um, testosterone will typically cause hair growth. So you have a mustache or you have a beard, you know, facial hair, okay? Now, a female does not want a mustache, okay? So if we, um, as females, we have testosterone that's produced in our body, we want to slow that down. We don't want to walk around with a beard and a mustache. None of us do. Unfortunately, with um, different medications and, of course, menopause, some um, females experience an increase in that because of the decrease in hormones after or during menopause. So in order to prevent that female from growing a mustache, we want to give her an antagonist. So you'll see that antagonist is going to fit into this receptor site, but it doesn't fit in like an agonist. So if you think of an agonist fitting into that receptor site perfectly, then that's going to create more and more testosterone, whereas that antagonist fits in the receptor site, but it doesn't fit in perfectly. So that's blocking the process. So it's kind of like connecting um, your puzzle. Once you get it all together, you have a perfect picture, typically. Um, I've had tons of puzzles with pieces missing. But anyway, back to the agonist and antagonist. I just wanted you to see how those um, either fit in perfectly to make it work, or it fits in, but not perfectly, so that it can block that receptor from completely connecting, okay? So that's where we're stopping the process is right there when that antagonist gets into the receptor site, okay? Now, how does it know where to go? Each receptor site has its own, um, I guess, what I would consider piece of the puzzle. Okay, only certain ligands will fit in certain receptors. So each receptor has its own shape and form. So that way it knows where to go. So if I'm taking a hormone or I'm taking something to increase hormones and I need to get it to my ovaries or whatever, those ligands know exactly where to go 
before they're ever going to find the receptor site that they are meant to be in. Okay, if that makes sense. So just kind of wanted to give you an example of putting those together to create that um, visualization of those ligands um, coming together with the receptor site in order to either um, produce or increase the activity that our body is already doing or stopping an activity or slowing that activity. Okay, so um, if you have any questions at all whatsoever, sometimes this can be a little difficult, but if you have any questions at all, again, like I always say, please email me the question, the slide number, so that I know what to refer back to, okay? So this is important in knowing your agonist versus your antagonist, okay? And this goes back to just knowing those key terms. This slide I just put in um, as we start talking about the processes in the body of absorption. Um, how does it get to where it needs to be in order to distribute the medication once we've taken that in? Um, once we start the distribution process, we move into metabolism. So where are we metabolizing these medications? And then once we've metabolized them and then we've used what we need of them, how are we going to get rid of the excess? Where does it excrete from? Okay, so typically it's usually kidneys, um, lungs, and GI tract. That's your excretion areas. Okay, so we will talk a little bit more in depth about those. But I just wanted you to kind of see the process there. So absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Let's start with absorption. Absorption is simply movement from site of administration to various tissues of the body. So it enters into the mouth and starts to process through the GI tract um, quickly into the liver. So it's basically just how the drug enters the body and passes into circulation to reach those receptor sites, those intended sites, okay, for absorption um, for that effect. So this takes place through um, three separate um, processes. So diffusion, osmosis, and filtration. And we're going to talk about all of those. But um, first, I want to talk about um, the video, of course. I always encourage you to watch those videos simply because since we're not face to face, sometimes having those little videos will trigger something when you're test taking, or maybe it explains it a little bit better by being able to actually see someone. Um, talk about it or write it out on video and just, you know, putting that video in your mind sometimes may help you recall some of these things. So um, in order for any medication to be dissolved, um, it has to have some type of solvent to do so. OK, now it has to be dissolved before our body can actually use it, of course. So our body being made up of, I don't know, close to 90 percent of something. What is it? What would you consider our universal solvent in the body? I'm guessing you're thinking water. So yes, water is actually our universal solvent in the body. Okay, so when you're giving medications to a patient and typically they have water at the bedside, always offer them water, of course, to help them swallow, number one. But two, that starts the absorption or the um, dissolution of that medication um, the minute they swallow, okay? So, and some medications actually say on the bottle or on the information, if they're in a hospital setting, you should be able to access some of those um, pieces of drug facts. But anyway, some medications say take with full glass of water, okay? And it's probably related to the dissolution of those medications. <clears throat> now, the ability of a drug to actually dissolve is called solubility. That's in your book. And solubility is actually controlled by the route of administration, okay? So if we give something oral in tablet form, then of course it's going to take a lot longer um, for that to dissolve and for us to start seeing the effects in our patient. But if we give a liquid form orally, it's a little bit different. It's already dissolved. Okay, so there's a difference in those two. Now, when you're giving medications to patients, we talked about giving them water. That starts that dissolution process immediately. Um, now let's talk about um, the routes of administration and how they have different effects, okay? Um, 
of course, absorption is always slower when you give tablets through um, the oral route, obviously. Um, anything that starts there has to be absorbed and goes through the first pass and et cetera, et cetera. So we all know that if you look on page 25, and there's another slide that talks about this, the fastest route of um, receiving medication and absorption, of course, is always going to be either inhalation into the lungs or through an IV. Okay, you'll see this on the next one, um, how quickly um, each route is absorbed or from the fastest to the slowest routes of absorption. And you guys need to understand those and know which one is the quickest and the slowest because you will have questions that will relate to that. It's not going to specifically say, tell me the fastest route of absorption. Okay, it's going to give you a question probably about giving a medication IV or giving a medication oral. It's just going to ask you something related to that and you need to know somewhere um, which is the quickest and which is the slowest, okay? So be mindful of those things. And let's talk about diffusion, osmosis, and filtration um, and the different things that can affect absorption. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. One factor that comes into mind about um, absorption and the effects that it can cause is grapefruit juice. You guys are going to learn about grapefruit juice all through this um, trimester and how it um, can inhibit or slower or even lessen the absorption of medications. So that, that's just one effect of absorption. Okay, we talked a little bit about um, the liver in the first pass with that type of a absorption um, with an impaired liver, but of course um, grapefruit juice is typically one of the larger or most used um, affects for absorption, especially in the testing and probably even on your NCLEX. So just be mindful of that. Grapefruit juice does affect that absorption just as well as um, Tums or any of those type medications you would take for acid reflux. Now, when we talk about metabolism, one of the first things that we really need to understand is the first pass effect. So when I talk about the first pass effect, I'm talking about drugs and when they're administered, this is where they're transformed in order for our body to use them. They're, most of them um, are transformed in the liver. So we all know that liver disease can impair that transformation and reduces the availability of drugs that are given to our patients. Okay, so when we talk about the first pass effect, this is initially talking about or referring to a healthy liver. Okay, so when we talk about how much of a drug that is actually inactivated initially in a healthy liver, we then think about how much a patient is actually receiving um, in someone who has some type of liver disease, maybe cirrhosis or liver cancer. So those will affect the first pass effect even greater. So if the first pass effect decreases that bioavailability in a healthy liver, then like I said, it is significantly lowering that availability of that medication to a patient who has some type of um, liver disease. So for patients who have some type of liver disease and they're taking a prescription medication, um, you'll typically see them um, have their medication changed either to IV or some type of sublingual for that reason. So we just avoid that first pass effect completely. So if you're taking something sublingual, it's going to immediately just go to the site of action. Okay, those receptors. Now, I will tell you one little tidbit of information, and I think it's also in your book. Um, African Americans with hypertension actually require higher doses simply because um, it's linked to their genetics and their enzymes pathway in the liver are different. No really proven statistics or um, information on why, but they're just different. Um, so one little variance there in the first pass effect based on genetics. So your main takeaway for this um, <clears throat> first pass effect is that you have to understand 
that it decreases the drug availability. So what we're gonna do as a nurse, or what we have to think about as nurses is, first of all, you have a compromised um, liver. So they're not getting the same effect from the drugs that are given as a healthy liver would. So then we start to look for um, alternatives um, and we are looking for um, even higher doses sometimes. We're looking for those physicians or we're monitoring for those physicians when we see those um, diagnoses um, or the newly diagnosed liver disease, we'll see them um, either increase medication dosages or we will um, see them change the route in which they're administered. Okay, so the first pass effect, remember, only applies to oral medications, okay, not um, IV or anything like that, just like I said, okay. So um, there's a few drugs specifically that are significantly reduced by the um, first pass, and morphine is one of them. Um, I think the statistic was like more than 70% is metabolized in the liver before it ever reaches circulation. So if you can imagine you're only getting 30% of that medication, you may have to have it more often or a larger dose if your liver is impaired. So nitroglycerin is another one. It's typically we see our patients taking that sublingual, even at home, they're taking it sublingual um, because we want that to go to that heart through the circulation immediately. We don't want to wait for that first pass effect. Um, so if you can imagine if I'm taking nitroglycerin and I have to wait for it to take place uh, or to, to start the process orally, it metabolizes, it goes through the first pass effect, I'm probably already on my way to the ER. Um, so that's why we give those sublingual, so we don't have that reduce effect. So if you have any questions about that first pass metabolism, please, again, email me, let me know. Um, it's extremely important that you know and understand the first pass effect and that the bioavailability of our medications are sometimes nearly cut in half um, in that first pass effect. So again, going back to your nursing responsibilities or your physician's orders, you're gonna see a change in medication, either the dose is going to increase or you're gonna see it given in a different um, route.
So absorption and the route of administration. Okay, so obviously we have our enteral or oral. Okay, um, this is any method that introduces a medication into the GI tract, including our feeding tubes and um, anything that may be inserted rectally. Rarely ever see that, but remember we do have those um, like suppositories for Tylenol. Okay, infants a lot of times they'll use Tylenol suppositories. So we do have methods that we use that are described as enteral, but they're not going into our mouth, remember. Okay, so parenteral is by injection. Okay, so this is a form of, many of you who worked in a hospital, you may be familiar with TPN and lipids. So this is given by injection, or sometimes parenteral may be given through an IV. Okay, so that's how Anything outside of the GI tract is considered parenteral, okay? So think of TPN and lipids. Anything, if a um, patient can't have anything by mouth, they're going to probably get their nutritional needs by a parenteral injection, okay? Or parenteral by IV. And think about those TPN and lipids, okay? Um, Sub-Q is just, of course, right below the skin. Um, between the fat layer above the muscle. Intramuscular is, of course, into the muscle. IV, of course, is into the vein. That's not rocket science. Um, percutaneous is right directly through the skin. Um, topical, you can put this on the skin. Topical medications also include um, eyes, ears, and any type of ointments, okay? Sublingual is under under your tongue, buccal is in the cheek, and of course inhalation is breathing in. That's um, mostly respiratory drugs, so um, you can look at those on page 25, uh, figure 3.2. Okay, so just be familiar with the different types of um, administration for those. And now the what you really need to focus on is what is the quickest route of absorption? Okay, so IV is truly going to be your quickest um, route of administration as far as medication. So IV route is the quickest. So if you're giving something IV, be sure that you understand you can't retract it. Once it's in there, it's in there. Okay, um, enteral. Of course, in oral, you're given a medication by mouth. It's probably going to take about 30 minutes or more for that to begin to break down and start to see some effects of that. Okay, so know the different um, the difference in in time frames. Okay, so IV of course is going to be your quickest. Enteral of course is not. And so remember, if you have a patient again who has some type of GI tract. Um, motility issue or something like that, then that route um, and that absorption is going to be impaired, okay? So if you have any questions about um, any of those, again, email me with your questions. So a couple other factors that can affect absorption outside of a liver impairment in your patient would be um, blood flow at the absorption site. If you have low perfusion in that gut area, then you are less likely to be absorbing the medication um, at a normal rate. Um, surface area of absorption, of course, again, going back to that gut, if you have gastroschisis or short gut syndrome, you don't have as much um, GI tract as a normal person would, um, or you have, again, those stomach cancers or some type of intestinal, maybe ulcers in the stomach. So your surface area for absorption is smaller. Um, and so gastric impede, Emptying, of course, we want our GI tract to move at a pace slow enough so that the medications can actually be absorbed. If you can imagine maybe someone with IBS who has that, um, they may eat and immediately have to run to the restroom. Well, if they've taken a medication, same thing. If their intestinal tract is not moving slow enough to absorb, then we're not getting the effects of the medication, the desired effects 
of that medication for our patients. Um, intestinal motility, I've just talked about that. Um, one of the big things is post-surgical patients. Their um, GI tract is very sluggish after surgery. And that's partially um, due to the anesthesia that they're given. So that's why you always want to be mindful of assessing your patient and assessing for bowel sounds after surgery in all four quadrants. Make sure that before you ever give them any type of um, foods, typically they'll start with a liquid diet and advance as tolerated. But this is why you want to monitor that is because if you have food just sitting there, of course, it's going to make them nauseous and they'll throw up and so forth. But as far as um, absorption of medications, we have to make sure that the GI tract is number one, receiving blood so that it can absorb those medications and that there's enough surface area there to absorb. And then of course, going back to that gastric emptying, gastroparesis, sometimes diabetics have um, a tendency to have um, a paralyzed area in the GI tract um, that is very slow to empty. So if you can also think about the reverse, if you have that medication just sitting there absorbing, um, sometimes maybe they get the full amount of that medication. And you know you just have to really think about the toxicity at that point if, um, if your gut is not emptying correctly. Okay, so just be aware of the other factors that can also affect absorption. Now, with that being said, remember that if you have this type of um, absorption or malabsorption um, instances, you're going to see those um, drug orders increased. You're going to see an increase in the amount that you're giving, or you're going to see the frequency increase. Okay, so be mindful of that when you're thinking about absorption. So you're going to do one of two things. You're going to see an increase in the dose, or you're going to see an increase in the, the number of times that patient is given that medication. So this is just here for you to have a visual in what I was referring to when I talked about the quickest route of absorption. Okay, so IV or inhalation obviously is going to be the fastest. It's a direct route into our circulatory system. Okay, so um, you'll start looking at these and just know that if you have a patient who needs a medication stat, how are you going to give it? Obviously IV. Um, if you have someone who's taking medication for a headache, and we're not going to give them something IV typically. So they're going to get those tablets and capsules and things like that. So that's going to be your oral route. So those are going to be your slower routes. Okay, you're going to see um, the quickest results from your IVs and your inhalations. Okay, so be mindful of those. Okay, think about some of the subcutaneous um, injections that you might give the insulins and things like that. Okay, so I just kind of wanted to give you a visual of fastest route to the slowest route as far as administration. <clears throat> See, now let's talk about distribution. We've talked about absorption and distribution is simply the movement of drugs through the circulatory system to their intended side of action. Now, we um, know that once they're absorbed, they are not spread evenly throughout the body. Drugs dissolve differently and they're absorbed differently. When we talk about fat soluble versus water soluble, there's a difference in how and where they're absorbed. So one of the biggest factors that affects distribution, of course, is perfusion. We know that typically perfusion or blood flow to the area, um, heart, lungs, kidneys, are much greater than our bones. So when we look at that, we know that we are going to receive more of that drug in those areas of greater perfusion than we are in those with lesser perfusion, such as our bones, skin, muscle, okay? So I think the book uses an example, uh, Valium, as the example. So many times when we talk about fat soluble, we're talking about anti-anxiety drugs. They're more prone to concentrate in fatty tissues. Um, so they're lipid loving, as I say, or lipophilic drugs. 
Now, other drugs that um, are dissolved in water, um, I think one example typically uses a tenolol. It's an antihypertensive. So it likes to stay in an area um, near the interstitial spaces because of the water content. So the problem with these fat-loving drugs and the distribution is if I'm taking Valium and it's being stored in a fatty area, what tends to happen is I've stored up a little bit of this Valium and I take it day after day after day and it's slowly releasing that rather than um, just going through the circulatory system and doing what it needs to do and excrete it, but done. It's holding on to that medication. So therefore, it's creating that longer lasting effect of the drug, okay? So as far as testing purposes, what you need to understand is if you have a lipid loving or fat loving drug that dissolves easier in lipids, they're gonna be stored somewhere and create that longer lasting effect, okay? Um, again, mostly your anti-anxiety drugs. So you have to be mindful of um, those who are continuing to take it and maybe they're not seeing quite the effect that they want to initially um, and they want to increase their dose. Well, we don't want to do that because we know it's a fat loving drug. But anyway, for testing purposes, make sure that you understand that with those fat stores, you're going to see an increase um, or a prolonged effect okay, of those medications. Now, we've talked about the permeability of drugs and how um, they penetrate tissues differently. So let's talk a little bit about the blood-brain barrier. Um, let's talk about meningitis, for instance. There are certain medications that we have to use specifically when we're treating uh, meningitis because of that blood-brain barrier. Um, we have to have a drug that can cross that barrier. If we can't get across the barrier, we can't treat the problem. Um, so there's one antibiotic, it's called rifampin. I use this example. Um, it's highly fat soluble, but it does cross the blood brain barrier. Whereas penicillin, which is a water soluble, it does not. It can't get through that blood brain barrier. So we have to look at what we can use to treat what area and take into consideration the barriers. Um, so I think that's pretty much everything on distribution that you really need to, to know about. Um, in order to be distributed, it has to be absorbed through the gut or the lungs, okay? So if there's an inhalation drug, of course, it's gonna be absorbed through the lungs and then passed on to our bloodstream, okay? So just be mindful of the effects I told you when we're storing those drugs, the fat-loving drugs. And if you have any questions about this, of course, always send me an email. So earlier we talked about um, the first pass effect and that most metabolism um, of drugs takes place in the liver. So we're gonna revisit that when we're talking about um, metabolism and that transformation of those medications to be used by the body. Okay, so any drug or anything at all that enters into the GI tract will be processed by the liver before it ever enters circulation. Okay, so remember we talked about the reduction um, of the availability because of that first pass effect. I talked to you about liver disease and how it prohibits um, absorption. So we have to be mindful of, um, again, changing that administration route so that they get the maximum effect from that medication. So factors that um, affect metabolism, we talked about, um, cirrhosis of the liver, um, and then again, that first pass effect. So just remember those, those factors do affect metabolism in the liver. Um, any type of liver disease at all whatsoever um, is going to affect metabolism. And how much of the drug will be um, inactivated by the first pass. Um, so drug dosing, again, I talked about this earlier, it may have to be adjusted to achieve that therapeutic action to see that medication perform in the way that it should be. Um, again, I think I use the example of um, sublingual versus uh, oral. So that way it's absorbed immediately, sent through the circulatory system, and we see the immediate effect. 
rather than waiting for that transformation through the liver. So that's metabolism or otherwise known as biotransformation. That one's pretty easy. You just have to remember again, um, you're either gonna see an increase in dose or you're gonna see the route changed if there is in fact an issue with the liver um, to metabolize those drugs. So finally, excretion and elimination. So when we're uh, eliminating, we're just removing all of those leftover metabolites from the body. Anything that the body can't use, um, we're getting rid of it. So we consider our kidneys the um, filtering system or our washing machine. Okay, so it filters everything from the blood. Um, like I said, keeps all the good stuff, flushes all the dirty stuff out in our urine. So just this side note, I want you guys to be aware of this because a lot of students tend to miss questions relating to labs or things like that because they don't understand the labs themselves. So when we're talking about excretion and elimination in relation to drugs, we're talking about drug clearance and kidney function. Remember I talked about if you have impaired kidneys, of course you're not going to excrete um, those medications at a normal rate. So creatinine clearance when they pull those labs is just basically an estimated rate at which blood is filtered by the kidney. Um, clearance meaning just the amount of the drug that's cleared out of the body per minute, okay? so. This is really important when we're talking about, especially elderly and infants. Um, this greatly assists our practitioners with avoiding toxicity in those patients, okay? Because if they're not filtering that or they're not eliminating that correctly, that medication is just sitting in their kidneys and it's not going anywhere. So they're more at risk for toxicity. Um, so some drugs enter and leave the body, quickly, okay? Some have, um, well, all of them have a half-life, okay? And so some have a longer half-life and some have a very short half-life. So the time it takes for the body to remove 50% of the drug is their half-life. So sometimes, especially with antibiotics, they may give a loading dose, which um, is prior to a maintenance dosing, sometimes like steroids, you know, we give a, a loading dose and then we continue with a maintenance dose. Um, so when that particular drug is discontinued, it's going to take 3.3 half-lives to reach their state of therapeutic levels. Now this goes back to peak and trough levels. Remember we talked about those, you can refer back to them, but if you're giving certain medications, and we want to see if we're therapeutic, then we're going to be drawing those peak and trough levels to make sure that we are within that range. If we're not, then we're probably going to do um, some labs and look at a BUN and creatinine. Look at that kidney function, see if they're clearing that drug appropriately. If not, then this is when you as a nurse start looking at those drug dosages. Are they decreasing? Okay, or are they Maybe instead of getting an antibiotic every six hours, you're going to start getting it every eight hours, things of that nature. OK, so if they're not excreting it, you're going to see those doses decrease. Um, same thing with half life. So if drugs have a longer half life, you may only take that drug once a day. Now, if you have a drug that has a short life, you may take those two or even three times a day. So it just depends on their half life as to how often they're prescribed. Okay, so if you have any questions on excretion, please let me know.
So let's talk about some drug responses. We're going to talk about idiosyncratic, paradoxical, and some hypersensitivities. Um, so let's start with the idiosyncratic responses. This is just a strange, a peculiar, and an unpredicted response to medications. I feel sure some of you have probably even used the analogy um, that I like this person or I love hanging out with this person in spite of their idiosyncrasies. I can't even say the word idiosyncrasies. <clears throat> so that just means I like hanging out with them or I really like them, even though they're a little strange and peculiar. Um, maybe they have themselves some exaggerated responses. So just a little um, analogy there. So it's basically an abnormally exaggerated response to a usual or a typical dose of a drug, but it happens in very few um, individuals. Okay, so the idiosyncratic responses, again, is going to be your abnormally exaggerated response to a normal dose or a typical dose of a drug in very, very few individuals. And it is unpredictable, okay? Um, they're not necessarily an allergic reaction. They're not drug allergies necessarily. It's just you have that strange response, okay? One um, response, severe unpredicted response, sometimes that's idiosyncratic, is going to be Stephen Johnson syndrome. Now, typically, Stephen Johnson syndrome um, is one you'll hear about, and it is a very serious disorder. Um, it typically causes um, severe blistering of the skin and the mucous membranes, um, and it's caused by the reaction to the medication, whatever that medication might be. Um, so it starts with flu-like symptoms, and then again, I talked about this horrible, painful rash, and it spreads and it blisters um, all over the skin, and your skin basically sheds and dies off. Um, and we all know that that's not good. When we talk about, um, you've probably heard maybe um, toxic epidermal um, nec necrotitis. So we all know that, of course, necrosis is bad. So if you can imagine, um, necrolysis of the skin is bad. So Stephen Johnson syndrome is severe, um, but you guys need to know what that is. Stephen Johnson syndrome in that it um, typically happens because of an idiosyncratic response. So again, those are just strange, peculiar, unpredicted responses to normal doses of medication. Now your paradoxical responses, or of course paradox simply means self-contradictory. Okay, so the paradoxical responses are um, sleeping medications. Well, I, I took a Valium, it helped me sleep um, for most people who are normal. However, um, you have those patients who become hall walkers at night and they're restless. That's like giving Benadryl to a child. You're thinking, I'm gonna give them Benadryl and they'll sleep all night. No, they're awake, they're bouncing off the walls. That's your paradoxical responses, okay? Um, so hypersensitivities and allergies. So in order for this to happen, of course, you have to have some type of exposure to a particular drug. A lot of times this happens with um, antibiotics. A lot of people have allergies to different antibiotics. So how do we know? Well, they've been exposed to it, okay? So we always wanna make sure we're charting those in the system um, and making our patients aware also that they need to let their um, other care or physicians um, know that they have this hypersensitivity. Now, hypersensitivity and allergies can be a little different in that you can have a hypersensitivity to medication, specifically antibiotics, if they're IV, and it may be very, um, I don't want to say harmful, but when it's going through the IV, you will start to see a rash, a larger rash area around the site of injection or um, where the IV is going in. And it may be become red and inflamed, and it may even be itchy, but you're not going to get that anaphylactic response 
from a hypersensitivity where you will with an allergy. Okay, so if I come in and I said I'm allergic to vancomycin and you give me vancomycin and I have an anaphylactic response because I'm actually allergic to it, what are you going to do in that situation? Think about that for just a second. Your patient is short of breath. They're beginning to feel um, very anxious. They can't breathe well. So what are you going to do? You're the LPN. You gave this medication and maybe you didn't know they had an allergy to this medication. Maybe it was the first time you gave it. So what is your best action in that situation? So first of all, anaphylaxis is a life-threatening um, response. We want to make sure that we stay with the patient. We want to probably yell for help immediately, okay, notify our physician, and hopefully have um, some type of antidote for those particular reactions available quickly. So hypersensitivity, again, know the difference. Hypersensitivity is just, I have a little redness, I might be a little bit itchy, but a true allergy can cause greater responses, those anaphylactic responses where I can't breathe, my airway's closing off, and you as a nurse are gonna have to intervene immediately, okay? So your best response to this situation is you stay with your patient. Do not leave your patient. If you have to yell and scream down the hallway, whatever you need to do, do not leave your patient <clears throat> during an anaphylactic response. Um, clarify any drug allergies. I said they need to be charted. So a lot of times patients will tell you, oh, I'm allergic to this antibiotic, but they're not really allergic because when they've taken it in the past, they've had diarrhea. Um, that is not, or they've had some type of GI upset. Diarrhea is not an allergic reaction. They just don't want to experience that GI discomfort. So they'll put in their chart that they're allergic to it when in fact they're not. So we have to also educate them, okay? Rash, itching, tongue swelling, um, inability to breathe. Um, those are true allergies. And you guys will have to differentiate between those when it comes to testing time and you need to know how you're gonna intervene. What is your best action? You're at the bedside, what am I gonna immediately do? Okay, always remember, notify your physician. Stay with your patient, notify your MD. Um, clarify any drug allergies with your patient. Most patients nowadays in a facility are gonna be wearing armbands. Um, so then you're gonna to have to go back to the chart to see what they're allergic to if you don't have that little pop-up box on your electronic charting. So any question about those, again, let me know. So this is just a little clip about side effects and probably many of you are not even young enough to remember this comedian, but he is quite funny um, when he's talking about all of the side effects that can happen with drugs and how sometimes the side effects are worse than taking the drug or the condition that you're taking the drug for. So um, just take a few minutes and listen to his uh, rendition of side effects. Okay, so let's talk about some drug interactions. Um, when we talk about this, we're just talking about how the action of one drug can affect or change the action of another. So for instance, antibiotics in birth control typically do not mix. The sole purpose of taking birth control is to avoid pregnancy. However, if you take antibiotics while taking birth control, then it basically cancels out. Okay, so that's gonna be an antagonistic um, interaction. So that's where you get the one minus one equals zero, okay? So you take your birth control, you take antibiotics, you're back to square one, okay? You still are susceptible to pregnancy because that antibiotic has now canceled out your birth control. So synergistic, when we talk about it, we're talking about how one drug helps 
another drug have a desired effect where it complements um, complements each other. So I want to give you an example. So let's say we have a patient who has hypertension, high blood pressure, um, and we want to give them a combination medication. So we give them a beta blocker, which will slow the heart rate. And then we also give them a diuretic to reduce that fluid accumulation in the body. So that's going to be a synergistic combination. So we, we want to slow that heart rate and slow that blood pressure. And by doing so, we also have to do something with the excess fluid floating around in there. So by complementing that medication with a diuretic, then we can reduce hypertension and get rid of that excess fluid. So that's going to be your synergistic medications, okay? Antagonism, um, I always talk about this one with um, morphine and Narcan. So I've taken morphine because, you know, I either want to get high or I just want to completely um, feel numb. And then the police come along and see me passed out in my car or whatever the scenario might be. I typically use that because the police carry Narcan in their cars. So they see me passed out in my car or whatever, and they hit me with Narcan. So now they've taken away my high. So that's an antagonistic effect, okay? That police officer is an antagonist. Um, so additive effects is going to be, I just give you that example, one plus one equals two. Okay, so there's some equals their effects. So I can have Tylenol and Oxycodone. I can take them separately and I'm going to um, I'm going to get some type of pain relief. But when I put them together, it increases the effect of both of them. So a lot of times I use the example in labor and delivery because after delivery or a C-section, they'll usually give you Percocet, which is the Tylenol oxycodone uh, combination. So they work well together. Um, so the opioid, of course, plus a less addictive uh, pain medication so that you can wean off that fairly quickly, hopefully. Um, so it'll give you a little bit of um, a potent one and a little bit that's less addictive. But with the combination, then I get an additive effect of that medication. Okay, so know the difference in those two. Be able to um, answer questions about that on your testing. Um, now, I will tell you that there are some medications, especially IV fluid medications, that just do not mix well based solely on their chemical structure. Um, Rifampin is an antibiotic that we use, um, and calcium gluconate is a fluid that we would typically give neonates. Now, we would give those through a PIC line, which is teeny tiny, and so with the mixing of those two medications, um, it would create a precipitate, which is basically it crystallizes in your line. So then you can't flush it, you can't, you can't do anything with it. It's just gonna completely close off that access. So you have to be really careful about, excuse me, looking into our drug books or calling our pharmacy and cross-referencing those. Typically in your drug books, if you have a second to look at those, look up rifampin in your um, drug book or look up calcium gluconate and it will tell you um, that mixed with certain drugs, it will cause precipitates. Well, first of all, we don't want to lose our access if that's the only access we have, especially in a neonatal patient or an elderly patient when it's harder to gain access um, by mixing those two medications when we know or have the means to determine that they do not mix together well. So um, know what precipitates are and what causes them. Um, and again, as always, if you have any questions about those synergistic, antagonistic, or antagonism medications or those additive effects, please email me. So food and alcohol interactions. Um, we talked about distribution and so we know that we have many patients who are cigarette smokers. Um, 
cigarette smoking, of course, increases that heart rate, therefore speeds up metabolism and the distribution of our medications. So for instance, we have a patient who is a smoker. We're sending them home on um, a pain medication. I use that one just because it's easy and it makes sense. But they're a smoker, so they're smoking, they're taking their medications. However, it's being dis distributed a lot faster than if they were not a smoker. So they're needing that medication more often. So with cigarette smoking, if you were to see a test question and you have a smoker and um, their medications are just not lasting them as long, either A, you're going to see that medication dose increase, or most of the time you're just going to see them start to take it more often. So you're going to see that frequency of dosing um, increased. Grapefruit juice, you guys are going to see this probably a hundred times throughout this course and then medication administration. Grapefruit juice just simply interferes with metabolism and absorption of so many drugs. Um, so just be mindful if the question and answer is grapefruit juice, it's probably grapefruit juice, but just, just know that. Fatty meals can also interfere with, interfere with absorption in the GI tract. Okay, so if you eat a meal that's really fatty, it's basically lining the inside of your GI tract, those fatty fatty cells when it breaks down. So then your medication's not able to reach that absorption area. Okay, so fatty meals um, interfere with absorption in that method, in that way. And acids, of course, again, it's lining that stomach and it's interfering with the absorption. So typically with antacids, um, we have those patients avoid taking any medication within a two hour window of taking antacids, okay? Milk and caffeine interfere with absorption. Again, caffeine is also a stimulant, so um, caffeine too can increase the distribution of that medication also. Now, alcohol metabolism, along with the liver's first pass, can increase the impact or inhibit certain drugs. Remember, we talked about the first pass and how much of that drug is actually inactivated um, in that first pass. So also, alcohol can create liver damage, just as well as an overdose of Tylenol, okay, or acetaminophen. Just make sure that, um, here's what I want you to take away from alcohol and um, metabolism or interactions. Alcohol is a CNS depressant. So if you take alcohol or if you're drinking alcohol and you're taking it with another medication that is also a CNS depressant, then you're double dosing, okay? It's an agonist when you're taking a medication and you're drinking alcohol. So you're getting a double effect. So for testing purposes, what I want you to understand about CNS depressant and alcohol interactions with drugs is this. I understand, and you should understand, that alcohol is a CNS depressant. Yes, we know that. We say that all the time. But what does it actually mean to be CNS depressed? Okay, so when you're evaluating your patient or you're taking a test, how do you pick out the patient that has signs of CNS depression? Okay, so CNS depression is going to be signs of, you know, that lower heart rate, lower respiratory rate, shallow breathing. You may even have patients with some blurred vision. They're going to be your sedated patients. They're lethargic. So you can imagine if you take a medication that already lowers your heart rate, that already makes you a little um, sedate, and then you drink alcohol, so you've doubled the effects, okay? So just understand what it means to be uh, or to assess a patient who is CNS depressed. You have to know what the signs and symptoms of CNS depression actually are in order to be successful in testing. Don't just know that alcohol is a CNS depressant. If I drink alcohol, what signs are you going to see or what will your patient exhibit to lead you to CNS depressant? Okay, so that's what I want you to understand about the alcohol interaction as far as testing purposes go. Know what those CNS depressing signs are in your patient.
I feel like we've talked about factors that influence several times in different slides, but just to reiterate those, um, of course, dehydration leads to an increased amount of that drug circulating in the system. Overhydration is going to be, of course, you have too much water, so you're going to have a less concentration or a smaller concentration of that drug available. Um, decreased blood pressure just means that we're not dispersing that medication as quickly or as easily um, as we would like it to be. Um, we talked about perfusion and how that can um, affect your distribution. Okay, remember areas of um, higher perfusion, those kidneys, lungs, and the gut, uh, of course, are going to get more of that drug than bones, muscle, and skin because there's less perfusion, less blood flow to those areas. Um, body mass, again, is just talking about those fat stores versus no fat stores. Okay, remember, if we have a lipid-loving drug and we've got some of that stored in our body fat, of course, it creates that longer acting or longer um, effect of that drug. Okay, liver function is big. I explained that to you several times. Anytime you have a liver impairment, we either want to change the route of administration or you're gonna see um, an increase in dosages. Kidney function, same thing. GI function, same thing. Okay, GI function, we talked about the gastroschisis, the short gut syndrome. That goes back to your area or your surface area of absorption. Okay, so those are all factors that can influence the drug therapy. If you can remember when to increase and when to decrease, um, when to change the routes of administration, then you should probably do pretty well in testing. Okay, that Pharmacology, as I've said, is not just about knowing your drugs and knowing what they do, but you also have to factor in the condition of your patient in order to accommodate for that so that we don't overdose or underdose them. Okay, so if you have any questions about those factors, again, email me. I'll be more than happy to dive into that a little bit further if you have other questions. So when we're considering pediatrics, their metabolism, of course, is the highest. It's higher in infants, of course. I would love to have the metabolism of an infant um, at this age. <laughs> um, so their absorption is different, um, especially in premature infants. When I worked in the NICU, um, we have those little teeny tiny babies that are less than, you know, sometimes two pounds. So they have no fat stores and they have really thin skin. Um, so and their GI tract, everything is um, immature. So even their liver's immature. So with everything being immature, you're gonna have smaller doses, okay? Just pediatrics and the elderly are kind of the same when it comes to um, metabolism. So the, as, as that matures, you'll start to see those doses increase. But um, until we start seeing those um, fat stores increase and um, those organs mature, you're going to see decreased dosing. Um, of course, um, with an immature liver, you're going to have that lack of enzymes to break down substances. That's why, you know, babies are fed certain formula. Some babies um, may be um, born with certain conditions in where in which they lack those enzymes and so they have special formula um, that's already broken down for them so it's easier for them to digest um, so also infants who are um, immature or have thin skin they're easily dehydrated so remember we talked about if they're dehydrated they have an increased risk for um, greater circulation of medications okay so now one thing with pediatrics that we have to consider is when we're giving medications, if we're going to do an IM injection, an intramuscular, where are we going to give that? Think about that for just a second. What is the largest mus muscle on an infant or a pediatric patient? So it's going to be that. It's going to be your uh, vastus lateralis in your pediatric and especially your neonatal patients. And why? Because I just told you it is the most formed muscle or the largest muscle 
on your pediatric patients. Um, so that's where you would want to give those IM injections. So I think I've covered everything on this slide. Just remember with pediatrics, just about everything they have is immature. Um, they may lack that GI bacteria and those enzymes to help break down those substances. And so you're gonna see a smaller dose for those patients. And as they age, then you're gonna start seeing those doses increase. That's it in a nutshell. And remember where you're gonna give those injections, that's very important. I'm not gonna tell you it's important unless it's truly, truly important and you do need to remember that for testing purposes. So know which muscle to give that injection in and why you give it in that particular muscle. So again, that was your vasus lateralis. So let's talk about our elderly population and some things that affect them. Um, we've talked about metabolism, and so let's talk about metabolism in our older patients. Um, it's basically just slowing down the process of metabolism, um, and it can create many problems in our elderly patients. Um, that slowing down is basically um, related to a decreased blood flow typically um, to the liver. So many of our patients also have chronic illnesses such as high blood pressure, um, arthritis, maybe some chronic kidney disease. And then on top of that, we have some comorbidities, uh, maybe obesity and diabetes. And so these type of conditions um, require daily medications. So when we're taking those daily medications, some of them um, because of the decrease in metabolism and also um, our cardiac output decreases um, can create hazards for our patients. This is why we always talk about fall risks um, and safety measures for, measures for our patients if they're still living at home. So some of the medications that we've talked about that can create serious hazards for our patients are our cardiac drugs and diuretics. Okay, so if you have an older patient who's dehydrated, we all know that they probably nine times out of 10 are walking around dehydrated because they don't drink as often as they used to. Um, and this is a problem in our older patients. And so um, when they're dehydrated, it allows for more of that drug to enter the bloodstream and it greatly increases the effects of, or the actions of the drug that they're taking, which can lead to, again, those falls or even toxicity. Um, sometimes it is um, drug interactions um, due to polypharmacy. You know, some of our older patients, they go to their hometown pharmacy, but yet they're going to Walmart and other places to pick up prescriptions. Or maybe again, we talked about them taking certain herbals or vitamins that may interact with other medications that may increase that um, effect. So adverse drug reactions are more common in the elderly. Um, as we age, our body is less able to compensate um, for some of those side effects. So it um, makes our elderly population a little more vulnerable. Um, maybe they're at greater risk for drug reactions because of poor compliance. You know, some of the patients with those chronic illnesses, maybe you have a dementia patient um, who's taking medication, but they don't take it regularly because they can't remember to take it. Um, so that's where we start to see those adverse drug reactions. Of course, absorption um, may decrease in the GI tract. Again, <clears throat> that's just that decreased blood flow to um, the GI tract. Distribution affected by cardiac output and blood pressure. If your blood pressure is low, your cardiac output's low, your distribution's going to be down. Your heart's not working as hard. Um, it's a little bit slower, so it's not getting out there as quickly or as easily as it needs to be um, distributed. We talked about fat soluble ver drugs versus water soluble. Um, now, fat soluble drugs may be difficult for your older patients simply because. Many of them do tend to um, start to lose weight because number one, their metabolism has slowed down and they're not eating as much. So they have those decreased fat stores. So you're um, not gonna see, um, sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, 
you're not going to see those fat stored drugs. You're not going to see those drugs stored in those fat cells because they don't have them. Or it could go the other way. I talked about patients with obesity. So those patients may be at um, an increased risk for toxicity because they have a much um, larger area of fat stores. So those are just some of the things that you have to be mindful of in older patients. So when we're talking about all of these and our metabolism has slowed down, this is where as um, a nurse you're going to start to notice um, the milligrams or the medication doses, dosages are going to be less for older patients. Okay, so um, when you're testing, be mindful of that. If your metabolism is slowed down, you're not absorbing as well, you're not distributing as quickly, and you're not storing um, those fat-soluble drugs, you're going to see those um, administration, the drug administration, the milligrams and the dosages decrease. So be mindful of those. I think with this slide, I pretty much hit everything on the previous slide. We talked about the metabolism decreasing, the reduced liver flow, um, kidney function may be impaired, so their elimination, going back to that creatinine clearance, um, just making sure that that lab is um, checked to make sure that they are in fact excreting or eliminating that drug at an appropriate rate for the dose that they're taking. Um, again, I talked about forgetting their medication due to um, certain conditions, dementia, they don't remember what they're for, or they just simply don't want to take them. They don't like the side effects of them, um, whether they're perceived or actual. They may just read that it causes a side effect and they just refuse to take it. So again, that, that can be a struggle with our elderly patients. So when we're talking about drugs, we um, in their administration, we always want to address pregnancy and lactation. So teratogenic, that simply means that the medication that you may be prescribing to your patient can cause um, severe birth defects or, you know, even death uh, to a fetus if given during pregnancy. So the time frame is as early as two to 10 weeks. So they could be pregnant and not realize it and taking certain medications that are considered category X and um, during pregnancy. So we really have to watch. So the time between two and 10 weeks, the reason that is important is because that's when you start the, the heart, you start to see the heartbeat. And so our organs have already um, begin to appear and start to function. So they can be severely impaired and maybe not even form if you're taking certain medications. Okay, so um, we always want to be mindful of educating patients who are within that age range of pregnancy um, to make sure that they're either using protection or they are talking to their physician about stopping that medication if, in fact, they are contemplating pregnancy, okay, because we don't want to um, cause any undue harm to a fetus. So again, we go back to that risk versus benefits, okay, during pregnancy. So a lot of seizure medications have some side effects or um, teratogenic effects, so you have to be mindful about what you're giving your patient um, during pregnancy. So is it worth the risk of a possible teratogenic effect on your infant um, when you weigh the benefit of what it does for your patient. Okay, obviously we don't want anyone walking around um, seizing all the time because again, that too can cause harm to your infant when it's deprived of oxygen. So um, when, it, when we're talking about pregnancy and the teratogenic effects, again, go back to that risk versus benefit of giving that medication. Um, most prenatal vitamins um, are prescribed and they're regulated. That's early on. Most of the drugs that um, a, you know, a physician may prescribe, of course, always pass through that placenta. So opiates is a big thing, and I've talked about this before. 
in the NICU, we saw this um, on many occasions, moms taking some type of narcotic, opiates, street drugs, whatever, and they pass through the placenta. So then you immediately or automatically have an infant who's born drug addicted. And then they go through those withdrawal symptoms. Um, not a pretty sight to see, but it does happen. So we also wanna be aware of, again, educating those uh, pregnant patients um, when we talk about an immature blood-brain barrier, this is, of course, again, going back to your fetus um, that's immature. They have a lot of immature body parts. So anything that we put into mom crosses that placenta and can affect that infant. Okay, so um, we want to be mindful of those. So when we're talking about pregnancy, we also have to talk about lactation and that some medications pass through breast milk. I do know that I have seen many moms come in who are taking opiates and they still breastfeed, even though a minimal amount of that still passes through the breast milk. And we may be concerned, but we just have to educate them on the fact that many drugs can pass through the breast milk. Now, um, there are categories to establish the risks for drugs that are given during pregnancy. Of course, X is known to be teratogenic, and they typically, unless the benefit just extremely outweighs um, the risk, they do not give those. Category D is bad for babies, but again, you're going to go back to your risk versus benefits, okay? Um, many, many healthy pregnancies occur, even though they're taking medications. They just monitor those extremely um, closely, or they may even change that medication in order to prevent that until they get past the point of um, vital organs being formed, and they may need to transfer back to that medication. Um, so there's always alternatives, but we also, you know, we have to consult with the physician, educate the patient, and then just decide risk versus benefit. Okay, so with pregnancy and lactation, the biggest thing is knowing those categories that it does pass through breast milk and, um, it boils down to risk versus benefit. 